This is a place of peace and grace where all God's children have a home. Here all are loved and no one stands alone. You are welcome in our community, no matter your ethnicity, who you love, where you grew up, how much money you have, or the color of your skin. For here, we proclaim that each person is valuable, loved, and essential. You are welcome here. All are welcome here. Yes, indeed, you are welcome here. You are welcome no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey. And if you happen to have a big heart, you will find this congregation filled with disciples who have a big heart of caring, compassion for their neighbors both near and far. So come bring your big hearts to us. During the announcements, you saw all the activities that are going on in the life of this beloved congregation, faith, fellowship, and also outreach to an often hurting world. If you miss the announcements, you can go to our website and click on announcements or go to the latest issue of the reminder. Come join with us. Come. You are welcome here. And now we invite you to join in our call to worship and our opening prayer. Gracious light bearer, into the shadows of our isolation, you speak words of life and community. You call us to join our hands and hearts and to live boldly and radically. With you as our guide, let us work together to heal the broken places in our lives and the wounded places of the earth. Inspire us, gracious God, to be faithful, brave, and loving in all that we do and say. Now let us pray together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us join our voices together in our opening hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory. How are you today? Good. I want to ask you a question. So let's put on those thinking caps, okay? 
Boing. Boing. Okay. Do you ever get scared at night when you have to go to bed and maybe afraid of the dark? Raise your hand or shout it out. Yeah? Mrs. Bear, do you? Oh, Mrs. Bear does too. Come on over, Mrs. Bear. And what do you do when you get scared at night? Oh, you have a night light? Oh, maybe something like this and it lights up. Let's see. <gasps> yeah, okay. How about you? What do you have in your room? Do you have a night light? <laughs> Wonderful. Or maybe you have a little flashlight or maybe you leave the hall light on with your door closed a little bit. Wonderful. And what do you do if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're still scared? What do you do, Mrs. Bear? Uh-huh. Yes. <gasps> she snuggles up with the closest human, which usually is my daughter. <laughs> but if you ever got really scared, you could come find me, right? Yeah. Do you do that sometimes? Do you go into your adult's room? I had a little person, one of my children in my room last night in the middle of the night, had a bad dream. Yeah. So sometimes when we're scared, we might have a little light or we might go find someone who can comfort us. Wonderful. Well, that's a little bit like how we can rely on God. Because you know, God can be like a little light for you every day. You might be scared of something. You might be afraid of the dark, or you might be scared to try a new food. Oh, what do you got? Oh, you might be scared to talk to a new friend. Yeah, that's a good idea. There's lots of things that we can be scared of in this world, but God is always there to be a little beacon of light for you, a little ray of sunshine, okay? And if you're still scared, you can go find someone that you love and ask them to be your support and help you to be brave, right? So it could be one of your adults, it could be a friend, it could be a teacher, it could be a pastor. It could be me. <laughs> I love to help you. So I just want you to know that in this world, it's okay to be scared and it's wonderful and okay to use God as your light and your friends and family and everyone in your faith family to help you to be brave because we can be brave together. Wonderful. All right. Well, you know, I love you. God loves you. And Mrs. Bear loves you. So now stand up and look at your adults and say with me, may the good news of God's love be with you. Let us pass the peace. Let us now join our hearts in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Calling God and beckoning Christ. In scripture, we hear words from each of you that would call us to follow you. We hear the compelling words that call us to follow you, to serve you, and to join you in fishing for people. You call us to be your servants, true and bold. While we may not be hanging out by some lake shore heaving our fishnets for haddock, nonetheless you come into our homes and you come into our lives and you say, follow me. Now for sure, unlike those first disciples, we don't actually need to drop what we are doing to traipse behind you around the Galilean or Connecticut countryside. Actually, we can begin today, right here and now, to follow you, to become your disciples, and to work tirelessly for your courageous vision for our world. And so before taking even one more step outside into your beautiful yet often hurting world, we take this moment to offer these prayers for hope and healing for that world. We, of course, begin by thanking you for the blessings of family and friends, health and happiness, and our cherished 
family of faith. But please hear now our prayers for those who are struggling this day, for those people, especially innocent children who are hungry or homeless. May the coming days give them food, friendship, and shelter. For the victims of natural disasters, of the COVID virus, and of all, all the turbulent storms of life. For those who are ill this day, may the coming days bring them your healing, your peace, and your loving embrace. For our nation and for all the nations of the world, that all people might live together in peace and not strife, in tolerance and not bigotry, in justice and not injustice, in hope and not in despair. And finally, O oh God, we pray for this congregation, this bold and beloved community we call First Church. Even during these uncertain and unsettling times, may its mission, its ministry, and its life be filled to overflowing with energy and enthusiasm, bravery and courage. So all the world will know that we are Christians because of our hope, our joy, and yes, our love. Amen. Our first scripture passage for today is from the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is one of the most important books of the Old Testament, according to some scholars, and Isaiah one of the greatest prophets. The book is a collection of oracles, prophecies, and reports. The people at that time were feeling quite hopeless. Within this book, there are various sections, rebuke and promises, the hearing of Emmanuel, God with us, and so on. The words we will soon hear come from a selection called the Book of Comfort and the Promise and Purpose of Peace. Sounds pretty good, right? The Book of Comfort and the Promise and Purpose of Peace. We could all use a little more comfort and peace in our lives. The purpose of the verses, I'm convinced, is to silence the fears of all of us listeners and encourage the faith, even in times of distress and hardship. And then in our second reading for today, we hear Jesus calling his first disciples each of the four Gospels includes the calling of Jesus' disciples, and a few weeks ago, we heard Betsy use a passage from the Gospel of John. Today, we will hear a selection from the Gospel of Matthew. In this short narrative, Jesus walked alongside the Sea of Galilee and saw two brothers, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, throwing their fishing nets into the water. Jesus says to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And they followed him. The text continues on to another set of brothers, James and John. They too were fishing in a boat with their father. Jesus called to them, and they followed. I've read this passage many, many times, but I keep coming back to why Jesus called multiple disciples at the same time. Is there something about saying yes that's easier if you have a friend or buddy or brother with you? Is there some great significance about family doing these big things together? If I was a biblical scholar, I could spend more time researching this passage, but I'm not. So for now, I will note that doing things together can be comforting, inspiring, and educational. And isn't that true for us modern-day disciples? We need to hear words of comfort and inspiration from the prophets, and we need to be reminded that when we face challenges and new adventures, perhaps having a buddy or a friend by our side will help us to be bold 
and to be brave. Hear now these inspired words. Our first lesson from the prophet Isaiah. Listen to me in silence, O coastlands. Let the peoples renew their strength. Let them approach and then let them speak. Let us together draw near for judgment. Each one helps the other, saying to one another, take courage. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from the farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. And now from the Gospel of Matthew. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Thanks be to God for these holy words. Thank you. 
Amanda Gorman became the youngest inaugural poet in U.S. history when she recited her poem, The Hill We Climb, at President Joe Biden's swearing-in ceremony recently. Amanda, a recent graduate of Harvard University, and her twin sister were born prematurely, and Amanda was diagnosed with an auditory processing disorder in kindergarten and has struggled with speech articulation throughout her life. Recently, Amanda noted that she was unable to pronounce the letter R until a few years ago, and even to this day, sometimes she struggles with it. As someone who had a pretty bad lisp, I understand what she's going through. The 22-year-old Los Angeles resident and daughter of a school teacher began writing at an early age in an attempt to cope with a speech impediment her writing took off, and at the age of 14, she joined Write Girl, an LA-based nonprofit that helps teens discover the power of their voice through creative writing. Amanda credits the support of this group for giving her the courage and confidence to keep writing and to chase her dreams. By age 16, she was named the Youth Poet Laureate of Los Angeles. And Amanda credits her mom, her single mom, for her success and says that her mom taught her how to work hard, be brave, and compassionate. Like so many others, I was mesmerized by her poem and her ending keeps running through my head ever since she spoke those amazing words a few weeks ago. Perhaps the ending keeps running through my head because I've been thinking about this particular sermon for over a month now. And every known nook of our nation and every corner called our country, our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge, battered, and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. We do feel battered, don't we? I know a lot of us do. It's been quite a year. Can you imagine? It's almost a year that we've been suffering from this pandemic. In Amanda's amazing words, we are reminded that we are beautiful, yes, and battered, and brave. And as she said, there is always light. We just have to be brave enough to see it we just have to be brave enough to be it. And isn't that our call as faithful Christians to know that there is always light even in the darkest day and to see that light and share that light? Sometimes it's hard to do that alone though. We need a buddy, a brother or a sister, a partner. My little Lucas has had a tough year, to say the least. He doesn't like school, which breaks my heart, and he really didn't want to go back after winter break. You see, he had been home for several weeks doing school virtually and then having winter break. He was very anxious about going back into his elementary school. And that first morning after vacation, he had every excuse not to go. Mama, I don't feel good. Mama, I'm too tired. Mama, I'll miss you too much. Mama, there might be a fire drill. Lucas hates fire drills. I finally got him into the car, and on the drive, he was still obsessing about not wanting to go to school. As we turned into the school parking lot, Andrew, 
took his hand and said, Don't worry, Lucas. We can be brave together. I wish I had a video of that precious moment. Don't we all want someone holding our hand saying, don't worry, we can be brave together. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Sometimes we get our strength to be brave from God, from words of comfort and inspiration like the words from the prophet Isaiah. Sometimes we get the strength to be brave from the people around us, those whom we love, like a brother reaching out his hand. And sometimes it's from strangers who remind us of the importance of proclaiming the ideals of peace and hope, compassion, and respect. On Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving, Mark was standing in a long line at the grocery store. Everyone was keeping to themselves mostly, except for the man that was standing directly behind Mark. The man had the audacity to elbow Mark, point to a picture of Ellen DeGeneres on a magazine cover by the cash register, and loudly blurt out, we can't let this happen in the U.S. Gays are ruining our country. And then he pointed to a picture of a refugee family and said, I can't believe those terrorists are allowed in our country. They need to go home. And his words of hate continued. When Mark looked around, everyone in his own aisle and the people on both sides were grimacing and looking down. Men and women, white, black and brown, young and old, they were all looking down. Mark suddenly remembered himself as a six-year-old child. A family member once owned a home that was part of the Underground Railroad. His family members would sit behind the concrete slab under their deck and talk about what had happened at that house. Even as a small child, a young white man himself, Mark said he would die before he let that kind of open hate live in his world. Mark made that same resolution when he learned about the Holocaust in junior high and he felt that same exact fire in the grocery store line. Mark found himself, like everyone else, looking down, not knowing what to do, but he couldn't continue to do that. After about 30 seconds, something in him snapped. He put down his basket, turned around, and looked that man in the eyes. Mark was shocked by how badly he was shaking but words began spilling out of his mouth. Mark asked, I'm sorry, everyone, but I must ask for your support in addressing this hateful and ignorant man. Look up, please. Someone look up. I need you. I can't do this alone. People began to look up. Mark simply stated, those comments were inappropriate and I will not allow that kind of hate in my world. His reply, dude, calm down. I wasn't calling you names. By now, everyone was looking up. Mark continued shaking uncontrollably. You will stand in this line and you will keep your mouth shut. You won't speak. You will not address any of us. You will pay for your items and you will leave. I will not allow that kind of hate in my world. He kept trying to respond and Mark kept cutting him off by calmly repeating, you're done. I will not allow that kind of hate in my world. Eventually the man insulting others got quiet and looked down. 
By this point, all the people in Mark's line and the ones near it were all looking up, and he was the one looking down. Immediately, people started talking, and it wasn't out of embarrassment to pretend that something didn't happen, but it was because they were instantly bonded in some weird but beautiful way. Mark openly talked about the friends giving his partner and him were preparing, as well as the pre-Thanksgiving they had had earlier in the week for transgender youth who weren't invited home. Together, those random strangers silenced ignorant hate. Together, they made the choice to look up. Together, they shared a moment They were brave. For there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. When I think about the first disciples in Jesus' time, I often think about them as a team. I can't imagine all they went through following this preacher and radical guy that was turning society upside down. And then I think of us, this beloved church community, as a team. Despite being in our own separate spaces and longing to be together in this sacred space, we're still a team. Yes, battered, and yes, beautiful. We are a team that is called to see the light. Life isn't easy, and the world is a rough and harsh place. But we have each other, and through it all, we can be brave together, for there is always light. In this moment, in this sacred space, We give thanks to God for this brave, battered, and beautiful community and for a call to keep seeing the light and to keep being the light. Amen. Let us now join our voices in our closing hymn, God, You Spin the Whirling Planets. Let us now join together in our commissioning. Let us now go forth into the world in peace to be of good courage 
to hold fast to that which is good, to render to no one evil for evil, to strengthen the faint-hearted, to support the weak, to help the afflicted, to rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. May these words of Mickey Scott Bay Jones inspire us all. Together, we will create brave space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we have all caused wounds. In this space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We will not be perfect. This space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be. But it will be our brave space together and we will work on it side by side. Friends, it is good to be in this community with all of you, striving to be faithful, compassionate, and brave disciples in all that we do and say. Peace be with you. Amen. <laughs>